Have you ever been told part of a story, but no one cared to pause long enough to first give you the backstory? Many times you lost in the story or draw interesting conclusions or worse, believe something entirely false because you only saw or heard a small part missing the context and so misinterpreting what happened. <laughs> this happens all the time with my wife and I. She often jumps straight to the events and, and tells the punchline of the story where sometimes I give way too much context and backstory wanting to help people understand. But together, eventually with enough backstory and telling the events that happen, people can make sense of what is happening. Many people in our world today question the Bible's historical reliability and credibility. The argument often made is that most of the stories we read about Jesus are fables or fabrications by his delusional followers. It was written by ancient and primitive people and so has no value to modern people anymore. Some have claimed that it is compiled by the church as a means to control and manipulate people. What about you? When did you first hear the stories from? or about the Bible. Maybe like many watching, you did not grow up in a religious home. It was at school or in a movie or through a friend, maybe even at university that you discovered some of the stories about the Bible. Maybe you grew up in a Christian home and you remember some of the stories from your childhood or from church. Maybe you've even taken the time yourself to read some of it. I grew up in a Christian home and I remember fondly some of the stories and characters in the Bible. Yet there came a time in my journey that I started questioning. I had doubts and wondered, is any of this even true? Can I believe it? Is the story of Jesus as told in the Bible just hype by his super religious followers? Or is it history? Is there any evidence to suggest that the story in the Bible, or at least the story of Jesus, is historically reliable? For many of us, the reason we find it so easy to dismiss the Bible is because whilst we might have heard many Bible stories or stories about the Bible, no one has taken the time to sit you down and explain to you the story of the Bible. Maybe at the time you were too young or, or maybe the people who handed you the Bible and told you the stories didn't know the story of the Bible themselves. This might sound like semantics, but I want to suggest that this is significant. It's important to you. It's important to society. It's important to all of us. Almost as important as what is in the Bible itself, because the backstory sheds important light on the story and gives vital pieces of evidence that this is not hype by crazy followers, but history that is worth paying attention to. For many of us, we've never read the Bible. Sure, we have one or we've been given one, but who has time to read these days anyway? And so most of what we know is what we've been told. And if you don't know the Bible or the story of the Bible, it's easy to discount the stories in the Bible. Growing up in a Christian home, some of us might have heard or been around people who would say things like, if the Bible says it, that settles it. And this was okay for a younger version of ourselves. It was okay for the younger version of me, but it's not that simple anymore. Somewhere along the way, Someone pointed out to you what else the Bible says. The parts that don't often get talked about in church or the parts the priest or the pastor skipped over because they were too confronting, too challenging, and you started questioning. And maybe now you find it hard to reconcile what you read in the Bible with the reality that you find yourself in. It's just not believable reliable or helpful anymore. You want to be honest. You can't just look the other way. 
If that's you, stay tuned. For a while, it was me. I get it. Interestingly, the way we got our Bibles and the way we receive our Bibles today is not the way humanity got the Bible. To us, it comes neatly packaged and, and all put together, chaptered and versed, arranged in some coordinated sequence as though it was planned and, and authored as one complete unit. That is not the way the Bible came to humanity. Many people don't know this. There are some crazy ideas about how we got it and, and who's responsible for it. When surveyed, many people simply said, "Ah." Oh, I thought Jesus wrote it. If that's you, just for clarity and interest's sake, Jesus did not write it. But Jesus is the reason that we have it. As a matter of fact, Jesus didn't write any part of it, but all of it kind of speaks about Jesus. The story of the Bible doesn't begin in Genesis either. The one we get begins in Genesis. Yes, this is the first book in our Bibles, but the story of the Bible actually begins when Jesus is claimed to have appeared to people after he'd been dead and buried in a Jerusalem tomb. I want you to pause and consider this. The reason we have this thing called the Bible is not because Jesus wrote down his teachings or because his followers believed his message when he was alive and hung on every word. The reason we have this is because Jesus appears to people and many people after he's been crucified on a Roman cross and buried in a Jewish tomb. We'll examine some of the evidence for the resurrection in a coming episode. But if there was no resurrection, there would be no Bible. There would be no story. Heaps of so-called Jewish messiahs lived and championed the Jewish national cause and the Jewish aspirations to rid themselves of foreign occupation in Palestine. This was no new story from that perspective. Yet most of us haven't heard anything of these Jewish messiah leaders. But the life and death of Jesus only became a talking point to the Jews and to the Roman world because something happened. Something different in this story happened that hadn't happened in any of the other Jewish Messiah stories. With Jesus at his crucifixion, most ran away, devastated and defeated by his death. But now suddenly they came back claiming that something had happened, something that we cannot believe, something that they couldn't believe, but something that they saw and experienced. And only because they saw and experienced it, were they willing to talk about it. Jesus was who he claimed to be because hundreds of people saw him with their own eyes after he was raised from the tomb. Something happened, and only after the resurrection claim did anyone start to think about documenting or writing some of these things down, or even remembering the sayings of Jesus and the events of Jesus' life. One of these people who encountered the story of Jesus after the resurrection was the guy who we met earlier, the Greek doctor named Luke. Luke was from Antioch, not Jerusalem. And Luke was not a Jew. The reason Luke took the time to write and record the events and the story of Jesus was because he had a wealthy friend called Theophilus. And Theophilus had heard and become intrigued, had discovered and knew a lot of the eyewitnesses of the story of Jesus. And Theophilus had become convinced, listening to the story and the testimony from so many around that actually, maybe Jesus did rise from the dead. He never met Jesus, but he heard the stories from some of Jesus' followers and Theophilus started following. But he wanted an orderly and reliable account of the story. And so he asked 
this educated physician who had been around some of these eyewitnesses, he asked Luke to write down and record the events of Jesus' life. And that's where we are in Luke chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. Here's what Luke writes. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used the eyewitness report circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Please don't miss this. Luke is not setting out to write the Bible. That's not what Luke is doing. He had no idea that the account and what he was writing was actually going to be recorded, compiled and put together in what we here today call the Bible. That was not Luke's goal or Luke's purpose. Luke was conscripted by Theophilus to write down an account so that Theophilus could see and understand and know that these events that he'd heard about were true and accurate. And so Luke is simply creating an orderly account of events based on eyewitness testimony and those close to the events that he then went and interviewed. So the story of the Bible began with something strange, something out of the ordinary, something unbelievable to most, but undeniable to those who had witnessed it and seen it with their own eyes and heard it with their own ears who had touched, who had smelled, who tasted the reality of a risen Jesus. So you see, this is no hype. Rather rational, thinking, critical, educated people wanting to verify and clarify that the stories they'd been hearing and had been challenged by are true. Luke was careful in detailing these events. We see early on when he started writing his account, he's very particular about mentioning names, mentioning people, mentioning places, mentioning dates. And what that has done, that has helped that as we look at other historians, as we look at other ancient documents where we learn about the emperors, where we learn about the kings, where we learn about the rulers that were in Judea, we can see that Luke's account is historically accurate is historically reliable. We'll start the discovery in Luke chapter 1 verse 5, because here's what he writes. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Did you get that? Just in a few sentences, Luke mentions a number of people's names, where they were, who they were from, where they ruled. And so we can place in the story of history when these events took place and that these actually happened because those people lived. Herod was a common ruler in Judea. And anyone in the first century and those historical documents that we have about the first century testify to this point. Then later on in Luke chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, here's what Dr. Luke writes. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus. Now, from history, we can, we can see that Augustus indeed was emperor at the time. And the dates match when Luke says Augustus was Caesar and emperor. Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. And then he puts in brackets, this was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. If that is not factual and detailed, then I don't know what is. All return to their own ancestral towns and register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, 
to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. Luke just keeps dropping names, places, people, and positions us perfectly well in the story of history. And this so too positions Jesus and the story of Jesus firmly in history. Luke carries on, and in Luke 3, verse 1 to 2, we read this. It was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman emperor. See, we can track that. We can look at Roman history and know exactly when this was. Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea. Herod Antipas was ruler over Galilee. His brother Philip was ruler over Iturea and Trachonitis. And Lysanias was ruler over Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. And this time a message from God came to John, the son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. That's what I love about this account. Clearly, we can see that Luke was particular about the details. He was particular about the times and dates and the people. And he was determined that Theophilus get an accurate account of some of the stories that he'd been hearing. Some still look at this and go, hey, but that's all good. But this is Luke, one of the contributors of the Bible, justifying the historical reliability of the Bible. Isn't that kind of X justifying X? Doesn't work that way. So what about other historical documents? Are there other authors and extra biblical authors that speak about these events? Well, the historicity of Jesus Christ is well established by early Roman, Greek, and Jewish sources. These extra biblical writings affirm the majority details of the New Testament portrait of Jesus. The first century Jewish historian Flavius Josephus made specific reference to John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and James in his Antiquities of the Jews. In this work, Josephus gives many background details about the Herods, about the Sadducees and, and the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders of the time. The high priests like Annas and Caiaphas and the Roman emperors, for example, that are mentioned in the four Gospels and the book of Acts. The Roman governor, Pliny the Younger, in his works, Epistles. The Greek satirist, Lucian, in his work on the death of Peregrine. And the Jewish Talmud also mentions Jesus a number of times. So here we have extra biblical evidence that the historical Jesus actually lived. And so the accounts we read about in the Gospel of Luke and the other Gospels, we can know is historically accurate and reliable. I want to leave us with a story that Luke records. And he records this towards the end of the Gospel of Luke. And remember, Luke doesn't know that he's writing the Bible. Luke is just documenting the accounts as the eyewitnesses are sharing. And this is in Luke chapter 24, verse 13 to 34. Here's what it reads. That same day, two of Jesus' followers, this is the day of the resurrection, were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. Many commentators look at that and go, man, Luke is really detailed about some of the specifics he mentions. Two followers on the road to Emmaus, and it is seven miles. We can measure that. We can test to see if that is actually accurate. And it is. The town Emmaus exists close to Jerusalem. And it wasn't uncommon for people to walk that stretch of road. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. And then one of them, Cleopas, replied, 
He must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there in the last few days. I want to pause there. Jesus here meets with these two disciples. They're not part of the inner circle. They're not part of the 12. They're not the heroes that, of, of the story. They're not even known to most people when we look at the biblical story. And so many look at this and go, why would Luke record this? Why would he make this up if this were not true? He then mentions one of them and he says his name is Cleopas. So anyone who was an eyewitness of the time could go back and talk and ask and find Cleopas and say, hey, Cleopas, did this happen? And then Jesus doesn't make himself known either. Jesus says, what things? He asked. The things that happened To Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles. And he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death. And they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some woman from the group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and they had seen angels who told them that Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the woman had said. Now, I want to pause there. The reason why the men ran out after the woman gave this testimony is because back in those days, women were not considered credible witnesses. So once the woman gave the report, true to context and history and culture, the men were like, nah, we can't believe this. And no one was expecting it. No one believed that these events would happen. So the men ran back to see if what the woman was saying was true. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all of scripture the things concerning himself. And remember, they still don't know that this is Jesus. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus at the end of their journey. Jesus acted as though... He were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures. And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem, where they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Just in this short story, there are so many witnesses that Luke mentions of people who saw the risen Jesus. And it's because of this fact that Theophilus is saying, Luke, I want you to get an account of the things that happened because this just seems unbelievable. But all those that saw it and all those that experienced it, to them it was undeniable. They had seen Jesus dead and now here he was with them alive. This is how we got the Bible. Not because someone sat and tried to piece it all together or someone tried to make up stories or record the teachings of Jesus when he was alive. No, it's because after the fact, they couldn't believe what they were seeing and hearing and then had to share and document some of these events because Jesus rose from the dead. Many years later, different pieces of the story were then pulled together and it's why we have the Bible like we do today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that we can read this account by Dr. Luke, that we can see 
the meticulous detail and accuracy that he preserved. But Lord, most of all, we thank you that we can have confidence and believe in the historical reliability of your death and resurrection, just as the Bible shares. We thank you for this and be with us as we continue to discover more of the evidence. In Jesus' name, amen.